is it's a huge amount of of data as well. Thank Enrico again, Thank and we'll move on to the next speaker. It'll be uh, Dave Cool talking about the uh, NRL effort in ionospheric DA. Do it pointed over there and then I go here. Yeah. Oh, that works. Oh, that's good. Okay. So, um, and then I went back. Okay. Uh, thank you all uh, for, for having me up here. And uh, kind of hard to follow Enrico's uh, 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 presentation because I am using physics based models and trying to do data simulation. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I think I'm going to try to argue that the area that I'm interested in, uh, I think there is some, uh, uh, there's some room for uh, some improvement and that we might be able to get something out of it. So uh, I work for the Navy with the Naval Research Lab. And, um, and so there's obviously a lot of people that are involved in this research here. Uh, and uh, so I'll just get into it. So um, the models that we use uh, is, is the model that we, the main model that we use for uh, at NRL is the NRL SAMI model. And uh, it has a, a magnetic field based model. And the magnetic field is strongly influenced by ion motion. Ions move easily along these field lines. Cross field motion drives the electric fields. You've all heard this from the previous talks. Some models address using field line grids. Uh, the, the geomagnetic coordinates use latitude, longitude, altitude relative to this geomagnetic poles as opposed to the geographic poles, which is why uh, a lot of these models, a lot of these space, uh, this ionospheric models use this geomagnetic grid. Um, so uh, the ionosphere uh, is made up of layers and is strongly controlled by pol polar forcing. And that's what obviously uh, Tom Berger was talking about, as well as at Swipsy. Uh, this uh, the the influence of the sun on the ionosphere is a major driving factor. Uh, the thickness and layering changes drastically with um, with no uh, no reinforcing solar wind at night. Uh, the ions recombine to neutral items uh, rapidly uh, in the dense particle environment. So uh, we've got this uh, this changing night day environment where it blows up, where it comes back down, and we have the layers the uh, D, E, F one, F two that sort of uh, emerge during the day, and then the E and the F during the night. So um, this could be seen in sort of uh, another form of this, where you could sort of see the altitude. Uh, versus of what we see in the ionosphere during the day versus the altitude that we see uh, versus the night. And um, however, with, with all of this and the, the sun's influence and trying to model the sun I, is extraordinarily important for this problem. Uh, there's another driving factor and uh, the neutral winds impact the ionosphere at these uh, lower altitudes through planetary and gravity waves. And uh, this is a secondary effect to the large solar forcing. Um, and, but however, it is a, uh, a driving factor in this lower portion of the ionosphere. And for us at the Navy, I mean, you've heard with SWIPC, they're interested, uh, I, they have, they've got a lot of interests, obviously, <laughs> but one of their, uh, their interests is the drag at the top of the ionosphere. We at the Navy are really interested in the lower part of the ionosphere in what uh, Sue Wei was talking about is the HF frequency and communications. So that's, that's what my job has been trying to do. And, um, and at that lower portion of the uh, ionosphere, uh, we have the, the winds uh, uh, form this smaller, more meteorological scale structures uh, that we can see. Uh, this is Aeroceo, uh incoherent scatter radar uh, results, and you can see all this uh, uh, these structures. So um, the electrons in the neutral density profiles, although the neutrals are dominate uh, the density, electrons play uh, and the ions play a role in the physics. Uh, the number of densities over the altitude in these ranges of altitude, there are large exchanges, uh, changes in the chemical composition, which greatly impacts both the neutral and the ionospheric uh, dynamics that we have. So um, what ionospheric observations uh, that we're working with? So uh, we've been talking about this uh, GNSS, a uh, global navigation satellites. 
Um, their dual frequency uh, signals can be used to estimate line integrated electron densities along ray paths from the transmitter to the receiver. Uh, it also applies to the ground-based receivers and then direct processing uh, requires an integration along the slant path, um, but transformations can be used to estimate uh, the vertical integrals that we're getting along those paths. Uh, another uh, ionospheric observation that we work with is ionosons, and the ionosons is a simple radar that points directly up into the ionosphere, returning a time-dependent radio frequency and electron density, and this is used to estimate this bottom side electron density profile. Uh, which I'm showing here in this uh, uh, in, in in this curve, this uh, solid line curve here, where you have the the dots, which are the um, the ionosond uh, retrieval that you actually get end up with. Um, so, how do the tr tropospheric and space weather uh, models uh, differentiate? Uh, the terrestrial models are usually on geographic grid, where the space weather models are geo geographic, geomagnetic, Earth-centered, Cartesian, 2D height integrated field lines. The grids, they vary, but vertical columns over the spherical shell is common. Um, and then the grids in the space weather model uh, follow magnetic field lines, and they don't necessarily align vertical columns. And then the systems of equations, the terrestrial weather is basically based upon Navier-Stokes, possibly with chemistry involved, whereas the space weather really relies on these Euler equations plus a subset of uh, Maxwell's equations. So the ionospheric models that we are kind of looking at and using is uh, first we have the IRI model, which is the Inter International uh, Reference Ionosphere. This is a publicly available model. It's empirical, it's statistical. The model provides climatological average, ionospheric densities at a given date and time and solar flux parameter. Now we have a version of that model, which is called Pi IRI and Victoria is going to be talking following this, uh, which is a uh, which is also publicly available, and it's the Python rewrite of this IRI, and it performs much faster than that. Um, as I was saying, the main model that we use at the Navy is NRL SAMI, and uh, that's not releasable because we're the DoD and we have to keep things behind the door, and uh, we can't we can't um, hand that out. So uh, it is a physics-based ionospheric model that solves the Euler equations for multiple ion species with ion sphere specific forcing terms. So what we have chosen to do is the first generation goal is we want to get an operational JEDI LETKF um, uh, to update the NRL SAMI uh, ensemble. So um, the initial setup that we're looking at is the JEDI LETKF with all the localization weights set to one. So it's an effectively a JEDI ETKF. Um, now, since we can't publicly release and we can't put uh, the NRL SAMI into the JEDI code system, what we've done is we've taken the PI IRI code and we've had it make the same output as we do in the NRL uh, SAMI mode. So that's a geomagnetic grid. So uh, we have, we can put PI IRI and we have put PI IRI into the internal uh, JEDI code base. And then that allows us to work, have uh, researchers and developers in um, uh, in Jedi uh, work with our model. Oh, there we go. And so they will be able to help us in over the following years of the more Jedi interfacing with the geomagnetic grids, with this iota ingesting of the ionospheric observations and ionospheric observation operators, as well as working on parameter estimated Jedi ionospheric ETKF. Uh, the JEDI PI RRI allows us for integration in the ionosphere C test within the development code to allow co-development on the tip of the JEDI, JEDI development. So JEDI development, and, and maybe uh, Huey will talk a little bit about this, is a very new code system. And you kind of, in order to really utilize the code, you really want to be at the forefront of the code. You want to be at the tip of the development. And if you fall behind that, you end up with a lot of problems. And and we, our, our uh, tropospheric work, they have, uh, they chose to be offline and that causes them to um, uh, uh, redo their code every six months. And that's a very costly uh, setup that they have uh, with JEDI. So, we're hoping with this PI IRI uh, sort of setup that we can avoid 
that complication uh, within JEDI. Uh, most of you have models that are publicly available, so you won't have a problem with that. If you get into JEDI, then you can just hopefully stay at the tip of that uh, with something like these C tests to make sure it doesn't break over time. Um, so the PIRI NRL SAMI grid, as I said, was a geomagnetic grid. You could sort of see what this looks like here on the right in the uh, uh, Cartesian uh, coordinates. We've highlighted uh, the lines near 0, 90, 180, and 270 degree at, at the equator. And then you see a cross section of this where the, this little red part is that uh, part of the grid. And then if you go way out to the black, those go way up and the atmosphere and then come back down. Uh, but you can see all these grids start at the uh, at the surface of the Earth and then they continue down back at the surface of the Earth. Um, now, the ionospheric uh, model space needs to be read into JEDI DA system. And we've already in integrated the PIRI NRL SAMI into the system, but we've, we've done it with this first setup. We've done a very simple read-in of the state space points with just a lat, lawn, and height. It's, it's very simple. It's an easy thing that we were able to integrate our system in. The bad thing is, is that this doesn't allow us to use many of the tools in JEDI work with in this model space grid, such as localization and other background air covariances. Um, so the main integration of models into JEDI is Atlas. That's sort of the direction that they've chose. You can go to GitHub and, and look at this. Uh, it's an ECMWF, a library of parallel data, data structures. Um, and, uh, uh, and so the, 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 it's very modern and it's very good. And the good thing is it's the direction that JEDI really wants to go in, it seems. The bad thing, it's, it's never been configured for geomagnetic grids. And so that uh, in order for us to use Atlas, we need to go to at, we need to go to the Atlas community and say, okay, we need to have you incorporate our grid. Now, um, I know Francois is going to talk uh, later on, and there's uh, there's another in between step, I think, where uh, possibly uh, Jedi will be able to sp uh, support some other methods to read in model space, and we'll still be able to use a lot of these um, uh, these tools like background air covariances and localizations. And uh, um, and so that's that. Th this is just sort of bringing up an issue that needs to be uh, dealt with. Um, and uh, so yeah, so that's one of the things that we're working on. The other thing is the ionospheric ops. We need to read the operate operational ionospheric observations into the IOTA system or Yoda system. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to say. Jedi. Um, we have three sets of observations that we are working with, as I uh, talked before, uh, the ionosons, their EDP files. Um, we're looking right now for a publicly available data set that we can uh, uh, bring that in. We have hooks to read in this data already, um, but However, the format is being modified into this universal unified data format, and then we're going to have to modify that once they change that. And uh, but this is part of working within Jedi. We have a community, so hopefully, as observations come along, we can all work together in order to get them in. This is just the first step: is these ionosends with EDPs, uh, the Slant Tech Cosmic Two observations. We're working on a, a reader for the Net CDF files, and then the GNSS Tech observations. Working on a reader for that Tech file. Also, that format is being modified, and we're going to be able. We're going to need to change those hooks in the future. Um, so, so we've uh, over the past couple months, really, we've been working on this first OBS operator with these um, with these ionosons. Uh, first, we have a uh, horizontal interpolator, uh, which we have right here, which uh, we we made on our side at NRL, and it basically takes these geomagnetic grid lines, which are in red, and it outputs a profile, which is straight up from the surface, and uh, uh, gives the uh, gives out a geovals. Geovals is this format of lat lawn profile uh, into the JEDI observation operator uh, setup. So um, wherever we cross these uh, these geomagnetic field lines, we end up giving our our profile. Once that profile gets fed into JEDI, then we can start utilizing some of the things that JEDI has already um, uh, developed. So like for ionosons, they're very in very similar to radiosons. And so then you get go from these geoval locations in green, and then it goes into the ionoson virtual heights. Um, similarly with uh, slant tech, if you go from these geovals uh, uh, profiles that are coming out, 
and then you have this uh, slant tech that goes from one satellite to another, then you can pull, it can interpolate to those lines, and then you can get uh, a profile along that line. And then again, in GNSS tech, you're going from a ground receiver up to a satellite, and you're pulling off those points. Now, there's two things that I need to add to this is that we need to add in temporal inter uh, interpolation into the ionosan so that it's not just like one state that you're feeding in and then uh, um, one model state, and then you're pulling off your ionosan, you, uh, you need to have some uh, 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 temporal interpolation to get the time right. Uh, the second thing is that currently in JEDI, the satellite observation operators uh, return only a bending angle because that's what they've been used for. They've never had to do this problem with, uh, with tech before. So now we have to uh, modify that so that it can either uh, end up giving us a summed up tech value, which is sort of summing the uh, uh, electron densities along the path, or uh, give us a trace path electron densities that we can then uh, sum up afterwards. So these are all things that we're working on and in, in, in more stuff we will have to do in the future. Um, another thing with this uh, data simulation of uh, uh, the ionosphere is this parameter estimation. And uh, Dan Hodes uh, uh, wrote a paper on this of looking at the Ian, ENKF algorithm with, uh, with the NRL SAMI uh, model, and that they uh, showed that the NRL SAMI states are highly correlated to the strong dependence on the global parameters, which we've really been talking about like with F10.7, that, that really sets the scale of, of, you know, what your model is at. And they demonstrated the importance of the parameter of F10.7 uh, on, uh, on setting what your level of the, uh, 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 of your fields are. And so when I say ensemble DA parameter estimation, it involves including these per perturbed parameters like F10.7, along with the perturbed state space in order to solve and fit to the observations. Otherwise you end up having a huge bias in your system. And so it may not just be F10.7, it could be other uh, uh, other uh, parameters as well, but it's incredibly important in order to do the DA problem for uh, for the ionosphere. So um, so the data simulation with at least F10.7 parameter estimation is necessary to correct these large biases. And this is something that we're working on in getting into the ETK up system as well. So uh, the ionospheric ETKF, the first generation JEDI system, um, why are we starting with the ETKF? Um, the NRL uh, model is forced with winds from an empirical statistical neutral atmosphere model, and it has an extremely low dimensionality to it. So uh, with only a few observations in parameter estimations of the solar forcing, um, basically with an ETKF, we can actually solve this. It's, it's a very low dimensional problem. That's what we're going for at the first step. The second generation is where everything gets complicated. And that's when we start forcing NRL SAMI through with the net Navy zero to 500 kilometer neutral atmosphere model. Uh, this bumps up the dimensionality of the system and we will then need to go into ionospheric LETKF mode. So we'll start with an ETKF and then we'll, once we get that working, then we can start working on the LETKF data, data problems. Now, the third, um, the third generation is really what we want to get to. And I think uh, 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 we, we, we talked about this a little bit more. It's the coupled ionospheric neutral atmosphere DA system. Um, so we are working on our neutral atmosphere is with the Navy's uh, Neptune model, and they are using uh, 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 JEDI for their assimilation as well. The high altitude version of that model, um, uh, we're, we're going to use the same thing because you know, it's already put into the system. We will be using an LETKF system though. Um, we'll utilize the LETKF system so that we can have this uh, efficient cross coupling and uh, uh, a coupled data simulation solved for it. And, uh, and so that, that's, that's where we want to get to at the end, where we have a thermosphere, drive, uh, a thermosphere driving our ionosphere, and then we have a data assimilation, which can assimilate both of those systems in concert. Uh, a lot of questions, a lot of problems, a couple data assimilation that need to be addressed before we get to that point. We've got some years to get through all those problems, but anyway, it's, it's exciting and it's going to be an interesting journey. So um, as I said, the, uh, the thermospheric models that we have at the Navy, right now we have operational NAVGEM, which only goes up to about 70 kilometers. We have a NAVGEM HA, which, uh, which is going to go operational next month. That goes up to 100, 115 kilometers. And then we have another version of this NAVGEM HA model, which actually goes up to about 500 kilometers. 
Um, Neptune, the next generation uh, tropospheric model, uh, it should be going operational in about a year from now. Uh, we've already developed a Neptune HA or and or developing a Neptune HA that goes up to 500 kilometers. And this is the system that we want to cycle and uh, with a uh, the data assimilation uh, where it's coupled to uh, to the ionospheric data assimilation. So uh, the I talked a little bit about that NAVGEM HA system, which goes up to about 115 kilometers. The observations that that system uses currently is uh, a lot of what Ricardo was talking about. It uses the MLS, which has temperature, water vapor, and uh, ozone. It uses Sabre temperatures, which you can sort of see where these uh, vertical resolution, and it also uses this SSMIS UAS radiances, which cover this area. Um, we don't have, uh, and then in the, we have done a lot of work using these meter radar winds, which uh, Tom uh, Berger was talking about, um, uh, and that could be potentially operational, and we're working at trying to get that operational. Um, we have, uh, but the only operational uh, observation that really is available is this SS SSMIS UAS. That's what's really holding the system together. And if any of you know about the DMSP and the F-17, we're not sure how long that's going to last. And it's 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 something that we're worried about, and thus we're we're going down the route of maybe the meteor radar winds or something that. Um, that could constrain it. But along with this assimilation, we do below 600 kilometers, we got 40.2 million every six hours, which are mainly tropospheric NADAR sounders that we're pulling into the system. Um, so uh, as far as the Navy ionospheric DA, we've got NEMO, um, that's, uh, that's operational within the month. <laughs> hopefully crossing fingers uh it's an ionospheric model it's based upon the navy nrl sami uh as i've told uh the da that's used right now is called ida 4d it's a 3d var with an fgat setup and uh the neutral atmosphere model that they're using in this operational system is imsis and hwm uh both empirical as i said the operational future is uh, we want to go with jedi and the ionosphere uh with an etkf uh, that's sort of around the order of uh, FY27, then the neutral atmosphere forcing, then the Jedi thermospheric LETKF, then the Jedi ionospheric LETKF, and then finally a fully coupled ionosphere. This is not necessarily in order. We don't know how things are going to go, but it's something that's where we're trying to go into the future. So uh, in summary, uh, the characteristics that differentiate the ionosphere from the atmosphere, charged particles, electromagnetic forces, external driving by long range correlations. Uh, the SAMI-3 ETKF pi IRI si system interfaces are built and working on OBS operator, more realistic input in running with single observation tests. And uh, hopefully that will actually be available on the open external JEDI repository soon so that you could download it and you can start looking at at least with the pi IRI and see what we've done there. Uh, the development needed for JEDI and the Navy ionosphere for the short term, we need more observation operators, uh, the parameter estimation medium term, we need observation integration with operators for future thermospheric ionospheric observation, oblique satellite drag, UV radiance assimilation, and then, of course, this support for geomagnetic grids. And then the long term is this coupled ionospheric thermospheric data assimilation. With all that said, there's one thing that we haven't talked about yet, and I, I, I just want to bring this up at the end, is using JEDI as a tool for verification and validation. So once you have your model into the JEDI system, and there are observations in the IOTA system, you um, with using the observation operators, you can interpolate from your model grid to those observations. And and then you can output that in the IOTA format. And you can do your statistical uh, analysis on how well you're doing. So you can do retrospectives of your model has run over a time period. You can feed it into the JEDI system and you can come up with you know, uh, uh, your, your, your state space at those observation locations and then you can do all your statistics. This is sort of as a community, as soon as we get more observations into the system, whether or not they're available for operational use, you can use them for verification and validation. And you can do cross model comparisons as well using the exact same operator. So you know that you guys are, are, are living and you're comparing on the same set. So I think anyway, um, if you're not quite ready to go into JEDI with the data assimilation, um, just getting into JEDI with uh, for verification and validation and cross 
um, collaboration with other entities, I think is something that that could be quite useful. So I'm sorry, I'm going to end with that. I probably went over time, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Dave. A lot of information. So I, I suggest we uh, hold on to the questions for the lunch and, and go straight to our next speaker. Um, and that's uh, Victoria on the I IRI. That's a mouthful, but Hi, everyone. So in terms of uh, the place of PyRI and JEDI, as Dave said, uh, we've done some work to uh, populate SEMI-3 model with